Hello, everybody who's just coming on to join us. I'm just going to give it a minute to allow a few more into the room. So we have quite a lot, quite a lot of attendees today. Uh, lots of people signed up. So I'm just giving us a few seconds so we can get everybody in. Just on Zoom, it takes a little while to admit everybody. Don't want you to miss out. Okay, um, we've still got people trickling in, um, but I'll get started uh, as they continue to arrive. So, uh, 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 as the slide says, my name is Sophie Antrobus. I'm a research associate at the Freeman Air and Space Institute. I'm so, so pleased to see so many people signing up today. I'm not really surprised it's such an interesting subject and so topical to be talking about the carrier strike group uh, as, as they are sailing having left uh, uh, this country in the spring so welcome everybody um, one thing i should point out to you immediately is we will be recording uh, this session that's so that we can then post it on our website later and uh, also to remind you that if you want to tweet about what we're talking about tweet about what's being said uh, our, uh, our twitter handle is at freeman underscore air uh, many of you, I'm sure, follow us already, but do 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 follow us if you don't. Do use that. The hashtag CSG21 is being widely used at the moment. I see no reason why we shouldn't just jump on that. So also hashtag CSG21. And then the um, final bit of admin I really have is about the questions. Please send us your questions. Lots of questions for uh, the two two stars who uh, will be introduced shortly. And um, please use the Q and A button on Zoom. I'm sure we're all more than familiar with that now after so long. Um, the chat function is disabled, so you will need to use Q and A. And on that note, I am going to hand over to Dr. David Jordan, one of our co-directors, and. He he will be chairing and uh, hosting the event. Over to you, David. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Um, and thank you everybody for uh, joining us today, as Sophie has said. Um, it's my very pleasant duty to introduce you to our two guests this afternoon to talk about Carrier Strike. And they are uh, Rear Admiral uh, Martin Connell, who is the Director of Force Generation, and Air Vice Marshal Al Marshall, who is the Air Officer Commanding in Number One Group, Royal Air Force. Um, and I wonder, gentlemen, um, and thank you for joining us. We're very grateful. I wonder, gentlemen, if I could ask you to begin, uh, perhaps by just outlining the nature of the two job, uh, job titles that I've described so that our audience can all be fully familiar with the uh, roles and tasks and burdens that fall upon you, please. Thank you. Shall I start? Yep, go for it, um, David, thank you. And Sophie, good afternoon. And good afternoon to everybody else. So Martin Connell, and as David said, my day job is uh, Director Force Generation for the Royal Navy. But we've had an organisational change within the Royal Navy over the last year or so. Uh, and prior to that, I was the senior responsible owner for the Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carrier programme. I also, um, I I'm the scheduling authority for the Navy. I have responsibility for generating ship submarines and task groups and aviation for operations. And then between Al and I, we oversee the governance of carrier strike as a program. And we are still in the relatively early stages of that. And perhaps we'll follow up on a bit more of that later. Al? Yeah, thanks, Martin. So, yeah, um, again, hello all. Uh, good to see you. Uh, it's great to see so many people online. Um, so, Air Office Commanding Number One Group, you know, the group uh, of the Royal Air Force. I look after all of our combat air, so fast jets, be it Typhoon, F-35 and Hawk. Uh, also, the Air Force's I-Star Forces, both remotely piloted and, and the crewed platforms. And also the Air and Space Warfare Centre, which actually has a sort of a supporting role in terms of mission data and programming for F-35. And, and yeah, clearly, as well as chairing the overall governance uh, along, alongside with uh, Martin, uh, my specific uh, equity and carrier strike is the F-35 and that wider enterprise. Uh, but clearly, um, I'm also involved in some of the other air supporting elements uh, that play into carrier strike. So, yeah, very much look forward to the conversation. David, back to you. Thank you. 
Um, I wonder if I could um, start the conversation off then by inquiring um, a rather general question, I suppose, or general option, option. But of course, we've seen, particularly over the last few weeks, speculation on the changing nature uh, of the world in terms of def um, explaining or giving you thoughts on how carrier strike is helping to address the demands of a changing world, please. Perhaps I can, I can start. Um, I think we've, we've got to look at where carrier strike sits among all the other capabilities that defence has. Um, we're still at a relatively early stage. So we declared an initial operating capability at the beginning of this year, and very soon afterwards, we've deployed our, our own strike group, which includes, importantly, uh, a US Marine Corps operational squadron, VMFA 211, and we've got a Dutch um, air frigate as well as integrated within the task group. And it would have been, I think, easy for us to set that benchmark relatively low. Let's do something quite close to the UK. Let's have a few milestones that we can try and measure against and then uh, rest on our laurels. But what we collectively did a couple of years ago now was aim for a quite an ambitious early operational headmark. And the manifestation of that is this deployment. And it's not just a, a cruise as it, it can often be rather crudely described. This is an operation. So we've, we've generated it very deliberately very carefully so that it can switch to combat operations from the outset. And indeed, early on in this deployment in July, uh, they did exactly that, combat strike missions. So the task group is ready for operations, a whole range of operations, but we're cognizant that this is still fairly early days, um, but we've achieved an enormous amount uh, already and I think there's, there's, there's much more still to come. And, and we very much recognize that this is about giving a, a suite of choices to, um, to policymakers. Um, and I think Carrier Strike Group 21 has already achieved that, um, uh, but I think there's much more to do. Yeah, um, I, I'd sort of agree with that, just to follow up on the question. You know, choices is, 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 is clearly part of it going forward. I think, um, I think the other thing we should realise, we've not really been doing this for the last decade uh, as the UK, so it is us re-entering the fray. And I think, you know, probably everybody would see this is a, a demonstration of, you know, UK ambition and sort of the, I guess, the level of our defence capability to be one of the few nations that now is fielding this fifth generation carrier. So there's, there's lots of elements to that. Clearly, there's a reputational benefit overall, but it allows us to another platform to develop our defence engagement, international aspirations. And, and I think, you know, I think we should not underestimate it's there at when it's needed to act as a bit of a deterrence with, you know, one of the world's best um, uh, combat airplanes on board with all the other capabilities of the strike group. So, um, yeah, I think as it matures and we should we should build on this deployment and it's ultimately there to offer the politicians political political choice. I think if I may, that we've we've deliberately um, built in within carrier strike as a capability interoperability and to a certain extent interchangeability from the outset again we could have said let's try and achieve some capabilities as the uk first and then when we're confident enough we'll reach out to friends allies partners to see uh, and get their input and cooperation but we've deliberately from the outset got interoperability um, and I think through this deployment, um, one, it's global scale. So we didn't seek to do a, a short near field type deployment. We've gone to the, literally the other side of the world. Uh, and that creates all sorts of logistical challenges, which we're learning from. Um, but we've proved we can do that. But we're operating along the way with different navies and air forces. And particularly, we've worked with those nations that have got F-35s. Um, and you know, I think I think that is, to me, it, it, that shows all sorts of opportunity. And when you're looking at military operations, the extent to which you can collaborate, be interchangeable, and have distributed operations is, I think, significant. Okay, thank you. I wonder if I could just pick up on um, 
one of the points um, that was raised there. Um, Al, you made the quite time uh, since the last carrier operations were conducted. Um, how has um, the Royal Air Force and how have the fleet air arm, how have they shaped their outputs over this, this time to meet what I suppose might be described as a new age um, of carrier operations? I wonder if I could uh, elicit the thoughts of both of you on that, please. Yeah, so I guess I'll perhaps open on that one. Yeah, you know, you're quite right since the demise of um, uh, Joint Force Harrier and the class of carriers that uh, the Harriers flew from, there has been, you know, quite a long gap. But actually during that, that's been filled programmatically and, you know, Martin and others have been involved in uh, the development of Carrier Strike and clearly lots of people have been developing F-35. But we've really invested into the, you know, intellectual energy and experience in making sure we were prepared for this moment. Ultimately, both services have had pilots, engineers and far more um, on exchange tours, some embarked, not embarked, to, to make sure we were here. So that was sustaining, uh, and we use the term seed corn on occasion with some of our other capabilities to try and keep things alive to allow us to quickly grow. So I, I think we've done that from an F-35 specific perspective. Um, you know, we've had it in for a few years now, but it is still early days. And, you know, I guess with all of our combat air, we've been trying to see what fifth generation offers and ultimately the threats of others having fifth generation uh, and making our, you know, Typhoons and F-35 as ready as we can for that a new, env new environment. So I think I'll be preparing in, in, in that way, getting ready. And, and the only other one I would offer, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pass it over to Martin, is... You know, in terms of, you know, multi-domain multi integration and multi-domain operations, again, that's quite key to, to carry a strike, as many people will get. You know, data being fundamental, being able to share it and spread it around, get the synergy from many platforms. And we've been developing that as an Air Force. The Navy have as well, and we're developing that for defence as well. So I think, you know, we're trying to plug into modernising warfare in the air and the air maritime um, environment with this capability using that experience we've you know we've tried to keep simmering and in some areas we've invested really deep to make sure we're ready um, for uh, this event in the years to come yeah i think this this is the largest um, task group deployment we've embarked upon in in about 20 years and in fact if we go back 20 years um, in fact exactly 20 years uh, september august september 2001 we deployed an Argonaut task group um, that was actually deploying to go and do an exercise in Amman, exercise safe Surya. Uh, and I was the lead planner for that, that task group. So uh, you know, having seen how this has evolved, I think it's, it's a really significant moment now. Um, but this has not been a, a, you know, a seamless linear trajectory from 2001 to 2021. We've had to, as Al said, think very carefully since the decision was made in 2010 to retire Harrier and the old CVS, the old carriers, uh, but invest in the new ones, think carefully how we can credibly get that capability. And we've had to work much closer R2 services and also work very closely with, in particular, the United States Navy, United States Marine Corps and, and the French. Um, because you can't just turn on those skill sets. Um, and there's a reason why. It, it, it's incredibly complex. and and. Many navies, I think, aspire to this level of capability, but find it really challenging. So um, without that support, we wouldn't be able to enjoy the sort of success and capability that we have today. Um, and I think that cooperation by embedding people in other navies and air forces um, is a real, um, a real boost to us. And so that when we started this deployment, we had expertise at numerous levels. So the person that's overseeing the flight deck um, has been in the cockpit of F-18 on combat operations with an American carrier. Uh, and there are countless other examples whereby um, we can use that experience in order to ensure that we can do maritime aviation safely. Um, but it's not been a cakewalk. It's been it's been really challenging uh, to do that, uh, and that has brought I think uh, our services together. And <coughs> speaking frankly, th that hasn't always been the case. And um, I think right now, when you see the relationship between Chief of the Air Staff, uh, Sea Lord, um, between um, Deputy Commander Operations and Fleet Commander in the Navy, and indeed 
Al and I, who've known each other for some time, um, yeah, I think that's been a necessary part of this as well. Yeah, David, I'll just I'll just quickly comment about that because I think yeah, that 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 joint, I guess, synergy collaboration is is absolutely key. And I know we've probably discussed it in the past, David. I was on that 2001 deployment as a junior Harry pilot that Martin mentions, and yeah, there was. It was more competitive, perhaps, than uh, teamwork, shall we say. Uh, on occasion, uh, it, it's not like that now. You know, it, it is really good. We're getting experience from both sides. You know, lots of synergy, huge amount of experience. And I think, you know, the fact that OC-617 Squadron, uh, you know, one of our most prestigious Royal Air Force squadrons, is the Embark Squadron. It's currently commanded by a, a Navy commander. I think, you know, that's probably just a, a bit of an example of, of where we come. So actually, right now, the most senior Royal Air Force uh, officer on board the carrier, I think, is a leader. You know, pretty junior, given the amount of Royal Air Force investment in that. And that's a tribute to the, the teamwork of all those those beneath us. It's going well, and, and we must make sure that persists um, to absolutely get the maximum out of the capability. OK, thank you. Um, several points, I think, um, potentially come out of this. I wonder if you could just explore um, a couple of them, Start, starting with really the obvious point that the sophistication of the both the F-35 and of course the Queen Elizabeth class is very considerable and obviously adapting to and making full use of those platforms potential um, will require uh, training and of course training is really quite expensive it often gets forgotten about in the wider media narrative but the the cost of training and the time required to deliver effective training um, can be quite a challenge is there is there, is there a particular degree of challenge, either economically or in terms of available time, uh, that faces both of you or, what, or perhaps one service more than the other in uh, delivering the necessary outputs to deliver the trained personnel uh, to deliver the effects of the strike group? Can we start? Or? Yeah, why not? Yeah. Right, so I'll start from the, you know, the aviation perspective, perhaps, because I guess we're probably further down the synthetic path, uh, maybe, than some of the, um, uh, the, uh, the more wider carriage group aspects. And I think, you know, you're right, David, to highlight this, it's hugely important. There is a financial aspect to this, you know, live flying is expensive, especially in fifth generation airplanes. So, you know, I think many may have heard of, I think, defences, but particularly, you know, the, the, the Royal Air Force or, um, the, you know, the Lightning Force as the joint RAF Royal Navy uh, mantle on sort of a live synthetic balance. Personally, I don't particularly like the term. I'd prefer a live synthetic mix. So, you know, you do as much training as you can in the synthetic environment that's appropriate to that. And I think what's fa fabulous and probably for the first time uh, on board, we've got two you know, pilot simulators, really. We can use those for currency, keep the skills up when we're in the middle of the Indian Ocean, for example, when there's not that much going on in terms of uh, an aviation environment. We can potentially do mission rehearsal more and more in the future as well. So I think that's a real leap. But you do need to do the live flying as well. We need to exercise the ship as well in terms of live flying because there are real live risks and skills in doing that. So I quite like the term, you know, a live virtual mix or a combination. We need to do as much of each as we feel we need to do. There is a little bit of a trade uh, between the two, um, but again, they both have their merits. I guess the, the caution I have on uh, making our training synthetic is I think we should go as far as we can, but there's also the reality that if you do less live flying, and I'm sure it's live operating overall, the ability of the enterprise, industry and many others to upscale that a number of times in times of conflict becomes that much different. So if you really denude the minimum, what we would call sustainment activity, live act activity you need to do, if there is a, a really difficult um, uh, sort of challenge or, or war, um, our confidence to be able to upscale 10 or 20 times in terms of the number of flying hours is something, something we need to look at. But, but that's sort of the, the, the live synthetic. I think overall, and I'm sure it's the same, and I'll let Martin in a minute, the F-35 is, is quite early on. We're through IOC. We're not initial operating capability. We're not at full operating capability. So right now, we regularly discuss, clearly, uh, Defence wants to get as much as it can as soon as it can out of the carrier enterprise. We understand that. But clearly, we need to invest the right proportion 
of our, our resource in training and growing the force over the coming years. So that's quite an active debate. We do have choices in there, um, but you know, you, you'd imagine that we just got to make sure, you know, we started so well on the journey, we now need to carry it through, uh, carry it through so we get all these capabilities at scale in the future. Yeah, I think just to build on that, um, there's, a, there's a real synchronicity challenge with, with training, uh, particularly when you're generating an integrated high-end um, fifth generation strike group such as this. And you've got to start, it starts with uh, making sure that all the individuals are trained to a certain level. Uh, and then you've got to make sure that all the bits of kit, the aircraft, the ships, uh, submarines, the staff, uh, all of that comes together at the right sort of time so that you can get effective collective training. And, um, and we've had to gauge very carefully each stage over the last 18 months or so to bring those constituent parts together. Because as you say, David, that training is expensive if it's done inefficiently. So what we can't afford to do is have Type 45 destroyers, carriers and jets all waiting for you know, the, the slowest mover to catch up. Um, and I think the next part of this is, is how we can bring new technologies to bear to make sure our training is as realistic and credible as it has to be. Uh, and there's more work we need to do in this regard. Um, you know, we, we are, as Al said, focusing on making sure we get that, that blend of simulated, virtual, synthetic training um, to the right level. And then you've got to bring live assets together as well. Um, we are at every level looking at how we can embrace new technology. So uh, if I just give you an example, we, I've just this week signed off on some virtual reality uh, capabilities for some of our deck crews on the carrier so that when they get to the carrier, we've been able to, to give them as best an idea of immersing themselves on the deck of an aircraft carrier before they actually get there. Um, before we were using old Harriers and sort of moving them around on the deck and it was fine to a point, but when they got to the carrier, they were a bit disorientated. Uh, that's just one very small tactical example. There are plenty of others. But uh, yeah, this is something which we've, uh, both our services are investing in. Uh, we both, both Navy and Air have programs over the next few years for how we can do better on training. And there's an overlap there. Um, so we're working together to see how we can maximize that. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the things that um, is further reinforced by your observations there, I think, of course, is that the carrier is at a relatively early stage in its career, as indeed is the F-35. And of course, there is something of a, almost, a, um, I suppose, an expectation that it's something that's almost come as a, as a ready to go and that what you get is pretty much what you've got throughout the entire capability of the uh, or life sorry of the of the two platforms which of course as you've exposed isn't necessarily the case and i wonder if i might ask you to outline perhaps some of the uh, challenges that you see for the future for both um air and maritime and some of the the notable differences i mean i'll start off by pitching in one example if i may just to get the um, discussion going there which of course is that there is now a space officer um, who can be embarked upon the carrier. And these days, uh, or of course in days gone by, one might get a MET brief, but now you can get a space brief to go with that. And I think that's sort of um, emblematic of the developments that are going forward. So I wonder if, you, uh, if you'd like to comment please on how you see the sort of changes, some of them subtle like, for example, the virtual reality training that you've mentioned, but how you see some of the changes um, coming to pass in the coming years of the, of the carrier F-35 combination uh, as we move first to full operating capability and then beyond it, please. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so, yeah, we are just past initial operating capability and, and we're moving towards a full operating capability in a few years' time, and, but it doesn't stop there. And if you take this decade... Um, so I'm, we're expecting that these aircraft carriers to be in service for decades. Um, but we expect the capabilities that will launch from that, those decks to evolve. And if we look at the task group, um, in a few years' time, we'll bring into service uh, Type 26 frigates. Um, they will be world-class anti-submarine frigates, and we will integrate them. We'll, we'll bring in new weapons. We've brought in new weapons this year, new weapons in the Wildcat helicopter. Uh, 
um, and you know that will carry on over the next couple of years. We're going to bring in new uh, surface weapons, air-to-surface weapons, uh, and, and sensors will evolve as well. I'll leave Al to talk about F-35 development. Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, when we look at sustainability as well, we've got RFA Fort Victoria that's doing a sterling job sustaining the task group uh, on this deployment and will do for the next few years. But we're looking forward to having new fleet solid support ships in uh, service by the end of the decade that will be able to take over that role and enhance it yet further again. So at every level, whether it's capability, sustainability, lethality, and indeed availability so that we can maximize um, how and where we use these task groups. There's a lot to do. But um, I think for this stage, and I know I've stressed this, but it's probably worth re-stressing, um, to deploy to the other side of the world the largest fifth generation F-35 air group and sustain it and operate it there. Um, I think uh, we should reflect on that. That is significant. But by no means do we think that's our level of ambition. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot more, as I've described, that we intend to do um, that will get at a capability that can be truly global, that, that has persistent capabilities, um, and that is truly interchangeable with our key allies. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Well, I sort of agree with that. I guess from a sort of the air, air element of the carrier strike group, you know, F-35, as people would imagine, has a whole program and a wish list of capability upgrades for the F-35B and all, all the other models. And, and we're bought into that. There's some key UK weapons to come on board, you know, UK procured weapons uh, in the program, such as Spear, Air to Ground and Meteor, Air to Air. We're looking forward to those. But I think it's um, F-35 is working really well now. Um, but to get it, the true value of that fifth gen, the synergy with the carrier, the synergy with other assets, true interop, real, really excellent interoperability with allies, take some of these upgrades. So I think that that's the obvious bit. I think uh, we, we're going down uh, that path anyway. I think over time we would be looking to see how air and the Royal Air Force can sort of integrate more with sort of longer range uh, capabilities such as Protector, our new remotely piloted air system, sort of plays into that uh, in the future again to, to real get the synergies of the mix as well as the extra uh, platforms uh, that, that Martin brings in. And, and there's some obvious stuff we wish to do. You know, on this particular carrier journey, we briefly stepped stepped ashore or hopped ashore with F-35, we did a quick hot refueling iteration. I think as we mature towards full operating capability and beyond, we would like to get the logistics and all the other aspects in place that, you know, we can very quickly take F-35 deployments on and off the carrier at various bits of the world to that utility. And then beyond that, again, you know, and I know Martin's got some programs and we're doing more and more experimentation in this area in both of our service, but as we go more to the, uh, the remotely piloted or the un uncrewed systems going forward, um, F-35 is part of the what we call the combat air mix going forward. You know, Typhoon will go out of service sort of in, uh, in around about two to three decades time. F-35 numbers will grow and we've got Tempest beyond, but actually, you know, unmanned versions of F-35, other unmanned systems or uncrewed systems um, from the carrier, um, I think we're all looking at. So, you know, it is really exciting and we, and we certainly won't stop. So I think, um, yeah, the, the, yeah, the carrier strike group of 2040 is something we can take a guess at, but I think it will probably be beyond our, uh, beyond our I think, imagination. You know, that, you know there, there are quite understandably questions which, which say, um, how soon are you going to have autonomous and uncrewed systems operating from the carrier? Um, and we certainly got that ambition. I mean, we're not shy about this at all. We, we definitely have that ambition. But as any, anybody who knows aviation from the sea, um, and a dark night in the North Atlantic, it's quite a challenging environment. Um, and a lot of the quite readily available drones that everybody seems to operate don't tend to fare that well in that environment. So, um, you know, we, we absolutely have that ambition. And, and the more observant uh, people will see that we have two carriers at sea right now. HMS Prince of Wales is around the UK, and, and sure enough, she's got a drone on board. So we, we, we've been trialing all sorts. We will continue to trial. We'll do that um, with industry partners. We'll do it collaboratively, as Al said, with new systems as they come online, and we'll do it with our key allies. There's definitely a lot more that we'll be doing uh, fairly soon on this. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I think if I may, because we have a number of questions from our audience, I'll move over um, rather than have me monopolising questions. I think you've actually um, answered uh, one of them from Harry Lai quite comprehensively. And Harry uh, asked how you thought the role of UAS would be in the future of carrier aviation. I think you've pretty much covered that. But just before I move on to the next question, which is also uh, technologically focused, um, I just wonder if there's anything you wish to add or um, do, do you think that you pretty much said all that needs to be said at the moment relating to UAS and the future of um, carrier aviation? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fair point, Harry, and, and, you know, I get asked this quite a lot. We, we have um, an experimental squadron that is um, testing all sorts of UAS systems. We're working with some industry partners to develop capabilities so that we can, as I described, that demanding environment that we can work with them so that we can see how that can be achieved. And what the real goal here is, what autonomous systems give you is persistence. Um, and that, uh, I think, will be um, the, one of the next sort of key game changers uh, over the next decade. And I think the other thing from sort of the air environment, again, uh, it's not a lot of people see it as quite digital, crude or not. I think we're looking quite a lot of, you know, crude and uncrewed teaming in order to sort of get the mass up, you know, be that crude and uncrewed F-35 or a, you know, a crewed F-35 or a piloted F-35 actually, you know, doing the command and control of a number of autonomous assets with it. So I think there's a blend. You know, I expect um, crude, there'll be a level of crude operation, crude, crude platform operation from uh, the, the carrier strike group all the way through. But yeah, this, this the opportunity that, that is given in all environments, but particularly sort of the air and the air maritime interface uh, environment, I think, you know, will be ex exploited as much as the technology allows. But, but, but bearing in mind, as Martin said, it's a pretty challenging environment. You know, the, the both the, the air environment around the car is very busy, people on deck, helicopters, fuel. You know, we've seen some of these nasty accidents in the past and, you know, we just need to be measured. So experimentation, tightly controlled, but you do need to get to a health, healthy level of assurance, perhaps more than you'd have in a land-based, you know, un, uncrewed system uh, to go forward. But yeah, we're, we're certainly on and, that. Yeah. And just to build on that, so, um, it might not mean much to many people watching, listening in, but we are the operating duty holders for the carrier and the jets and other aviation embarked. And by that, uh, one of our key roles is to ensure that all the risks of life are properly understood. Um, and between us, we've got that blend of expertise and we've got staffs who are working with us on that. Because as Al rightly said, um, that deck is, is, is busy, um, particularly at night, you've got lots of things going on um f-35 recovering and, and taking off you've got rotary wing you've got the ships refueling you've got other nations operating you've got an air defense zone around the carrier um, it's a complex bit of airspace uh, and it's a complex environment now that doesn't mean we can't introduce other capabilities absolutely we can but we want to do so in a safe and considered way um, and and what we're trying to do is have an operational capability at one end but also be doing experimentation as well. And I think, as I said earlier, you know, the fact that we've got, we've had the uh, F-35 training squadron embarked in Prince of Wales for the last few days, while also doing some experimentation with a drone, just gives you a sense of that in a very considered way, while at the high end, we've got uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth on her operations. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll come to um, two questions which are a, li a little similar. Um, one from um, an anonymous attendee, um, <laughs> which inquires, it appears as if our potential adversaries are ahead in the development of hypersonic missiles, and are, are you concerned about this, and is it something recognised and being addressed? And a similar question from uh, Ian Meek. Uh, who says that he trusts you consider the dangers of two aircraft carriers being hit by a Russian, Chinese, ISIS, uh, and of course other potential adversaries are available, um, an exocet in inverted commas uh, and shipping um, weapon. Um, and now he, he argues that perhaps having many um, options and decoys as well, which he sees as a tried and tested method. Um, I wonder if you care to comment on uh, Ian's possible solution and the uh, the challenges you envisage being presented by uh, advanced anti-shipping weapons, particularly in the uh, hypersonic uh, speed class, please. 
Yeah, I, I, there's no doubt that um, technologies evolve, you know, that, that history shows that. And um, we take the defense of our strike group very seriously indeed. Um, and the fact that it's got multi-layered protection um, with different sorts of sensors, different sorts of weapons, different sorts of decoys um, built into that strike group from the outset. Uh, and, you know, we're looking very closely at all of our working with our intelligence agencies and partners to un understand the situation around that strike group. Um, yes, we take it seriously. We watch and we've got our own develop capability developments as well. Um, and I think, you know, we shouldn't forget that this airfield tends to move. And, um, you know, that maritime maneuver is something that we shouldn't forget as well. Um, people are quick to say yes, but the world's all transparent these days. It's really challenging to uh, target a carrier, um, particularly when it's moving, you know, 500 miles in 24 hours. Um, so we take it seriously. We've thought about it very carefully for this deployment. We've got layered integrated air defense around uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth today, uh, and it's something that I'm sure will continue to evolve. Yeah, I sort of just going in, you know, I think on the hypersonics point, you know, yes, they're being developed at pace around the world. You know, we're looking at it uh, both from an offensive and a defensive uh, aspect as well. So, uh, yes, I think we're we're on to understanding that clearly some of it sits in the classified layer and, and that will develop as it goes. Um, the But, uh, you know, that's not just a threat to the carrier group. That's a threat to our home bases and, and many other deployments. So, you know, we're looking for resilience and agility and choice in of our land bases and the carrier in heavenly gives us quite a bit of choice anyway because we can position it and move it and and i think you know the if you zoom out a bit from the threat to the carrier group itself um ultimately you know it's about what you want to achieve is it you know with all your indicators and warnings there's a variety of ways we've got strike capabilities on submarines we can we can launch them at long ranges with air to air refueling from the air we can use the carrier group we can use a combination so um, I think if we zoom out a little bit from just the carrier strike group um, and look at the variety of choices in terms of survivability, how close we put ourselves, uh, and, you know, sort of multi-axis defence and attack, I think it can becomes a slightly different question. But I think, it, yeah, everybody's alive to the fact that there are some very impressive lethal technologies uh, around the world that has been the same for the last hundred years and you know our intelligence agencies and others our own research and development uh, look into those for both offensive you know and survivability uh, aspects okay thank you um, uh, just um, pointed out in the q a that uh, he was specifically referring as well to the Notion of SCADs um, containerized here. I would have to a question from uh, Andrew Brooks. Uh, he's all happy to recall how short we were of organic AEW during the Falklands campaign. Uh, is Crow's Nest on the same <laughs> naughty step as Ajax? So, Crow's Nest is, um, for those who aren't aware, is, is a sensor that's uh, fitted to the Merlin Mark II helicopter. Um, and it's well documented that it's, it's arrived in service later than we planned for it to be in service. Uh, and I've looked at that program really carefully. And on the balance, I, I determined that it was better at its developmental stage to embark it and carry on that development while we are on operations. Um, so there are crow's nest um, Merlins on board Queen Elizabeth. We're incrementally improving that capability through the deployment. So there are software drops that we are doing to those aircraft while on deployment and improving the capability. Um, but you're right. I mean, the history has told us that we need to have those eyes in the sky. Um, there's new technologies available today, as we discussed so uh, we're at an interesting period where we need to get the absolute maximum out of the crow's nest system that we've invested in. Um, and we're working hard, believe me, to do that. Um, but we've also simultaneously got to be looking at how we can get a persistent capability um, for the future. And we're doing exactly that. OK, thank you. Um, now, there are several questions uh, which relate to the sort of the wider potential future use um, of uh, carrier strike. Um, I'll start, if I may, with 
Um, uh, question from uh, Joel Jonas, uh, um, who asks, is the carrier strike group there to support an expected continuation of low intensity conflicts, which have dominated Britain's last two decades, or is it to shift away from this focus towards great power competition? Um, and then he asks, or is it both or neither? Um, a fairly more encompassing question there, but I'll start off with that for a minute and then move on to a couple of others. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's, it's um, but simply, it, 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 the carrier strike group can respond to a whole range of different potential scenarios. And, and we should remember that the strike group is not just the aircraft carrier and the jets, which is often how it gets characterized. The strike group is and we've actively tested this, this deployment, we can disaggregate it dependent on what the needs are. What do I mean by that? So earlier this year, we had operations in the Eastern Mediterranean, um, combat operations um, against Daesh, you know, in Iraq and Syria. Simultaneously, we had elements of the task group in the Black Sea. Um, uh, so it's hundreds of miles dispersed. Similarly, out in uh, the Indo-Pacific region, we were working with um, the Carl Vinson strike group and also uh, a U.S. Navy expeditionary strike group, so USS America. And, and by that, you can then disperse and disaggregate your capabilities across a huge area, hundreds and thousands of miles. Um, uh, so, you know, it's important we, we do that. So you can, for example, if there is an emerging crisis, detach a small element that's got capability to provide humanitarian assistance, disaster relief support, for example. Um, you don't need to divert the entire strike group to do that. Um, so from the very low-end constabulary style operations up to you know, high intensity warfare is exactly that, that spectrum that a carrier strike group can respond to. Uh, yeah, and I guess from sort of my perspective, I think, you know, F-35 is unmatched in terms of, you know, its lethality, its senses, its ability to access challenging contested airspace, uh, you know, and, and make a difference. We designed it to that. UK took a choice to be able to achieve the, the very challenging warfighting and um you know we can use it at a variety of scales at scales of conflict beneath that i guess my sort of personal view is that if there was a, an enduring low intensity conflict probably we would seek to address that on an, a sustained basis by other means and the, the carrier would perhaps be out for some of the other value it was given but again it comes back to martin's original point there's a there's a huge amount of choice uh in the carrier strike group aggregated disaggregated how you form it what air platforms and what balance of air platforms you put on it and we shouldn't have you know the aviation part of the carrier strike group you know is, is has got a huge amount of rotary wing aviation and all the choice that that gives you as well in the various roles so um i think it is designed for um you know i think i'm just looking at the term you know great power competition if that came to pass or really challenging um scenarios uh but uh, it gives us the utility to use it in, in all sorts of uh, types of i guess military endeavor Okay, thank you. Um, now I'll move on uh, to say a, a question in a similar vein. Um, that's from uh, Aaron Dawson. Uh, Aaron says, thanks both for your time this afternoon. Um, how do you respond to the criticisms that this is a token deployment, large enough to get us entangled in regional disputes, but itself an insufficient deterrent? Uh, and in view of your comments on interoperability, do you see <coughs> merit in the argument made by some allies um, that the UK focus on acting as a framework nation within the Euro, Euro deployments in the Indo-Pacific. Um, sorry, the two questions for the price of one there. Um, linked to that uh, is a question also, for, uh, another question from Harry Lai, where he says HMS Queen Elizabeth has embarked uh, US F-35s, as we know. Um, do you hope future deployments could see the same occur with Japanese, South Korean, Italian or other um, nation F-35 uh, Bravos and vice versa? Uh, and would you like to see UK F-35Bs deploy on other nations' carriers? Um, in so there uh, a series of sort of questions uh, to elicit your comments on the way in which you see the carrier and it, its embarked assets being used in terms of our relationships with allies uh, and other potential partner nations, please. Yeah, thanks. And thanks to Aaron and, and Harry for those. Um, so first of all, 
our carry strike group is attributed to NATO. So, you know, I don't, I don't know of any other NATO Navy that attributes fifth generation strike jets and carrier strike groups to NATO. NATO is the bedrock of our security and will continue to be. So, you know, we will, of course, it's our, it's our backyard, so to speak. Our strike groups are going to routinely operate in and around the NATO near field European theater. Um, they have done over the last couple of years as we generated this, we did the full integration and, and testing and trials around not just the UK, but using with some of our NATO allies as well. Um, and in subsequent years, we're going to definitely operate closer to, to the UK. Um, so I don't think it's tokenism this by any stretch. And as I've, I think, described that what we've tried to do with this deployment is set that operational um, bar sufficiently high. Um, and you know, for the practitioners out there, we've achieved so far in this deployment over three and a half thousand flying hours from the deck of HMS Queen Elizabeth. Now that, by any measure, is a significant volume of flying, and, and Al and I have described the level and, and the sorts of operations we've been conducting from the deck. Um, and some days achieving regularly over 90 hours of flying from the deck a day. So we've set the ambition both in terms of scale, operating the other side of the world, different theatres, passing through different operational theatres is not an easy sport. You've got to dock into the architectural theatre uh, network um, as you go into that theatre and operate with different allies. Um, that takes a degree of time to integrate. We've done that now through a series of different operational theatres. And logistically, particularly with supply chains challenged as they are right now, we've sustained the task group so far on the other side of the world and continue to. It's not been straightforward. We knew it would be difficult. We didn't quite plan the global pandemic into our thinking, but we've had to respond to that. So I would challenge, uh, Aaron, this, this view, which people say is tokenism. Uh, I don't think it is. Um, I think the very fact that other nations are watching what we're doing um, is interesting. I think the very fact that many of our friends, partners, both navies and air forces are very keen to operate with us. Um, we're really grateful for that. There's been a lot that we've achieved. We, we set out early on, as I said, to operate with different nations, navies and air forces. And we've been really pleased with the response. And uh, that integration is a real force multiplier, both in terms of what we can achieve together, but also the lessons we're learning together. So F-35 operating nations operating together um, we're learning together some lessons that go above the classification of this discussion, which are really significant. So um, we'll draw on that, we'll learn undoubtedly from this year, and we'll ad adapt what we do in our posture into 2022, 23, 24. Yeah, I'll just want to come back. You know, I think, again, it comes back to that choice. You know, the carry by intent deliberately allows us to you know, double down, enhance some of those relationships with other militaries, therefore, you know, other nations from a foreign policy aspect around the world uh, as, as we do it. That was by design. And so it offers lots of choice uh, in, in that area. So, um, yeah, you know, I noticed the what's it, uh, entangled in regional disputes. Well, yes, you could also read that as, you know, reinforce some of our links, our relationships, some of our extending commitments, you know, the uh, Five Powers Defence Agreement and others uh, in that part of the world, and, and you know, and we do have an intent to have relationships with with some of those nations. Going on to sort of Harry's uh, next question in terms of uh, embarked uh, US F 35s Yeah, you know, so the US Marine Corps have been operating F thirty five B a little bit longer than us, and that's been really useful. Uh, and I think maybe not what's come out is they didn't just turn up for this deployment. They've been with us for the at least uh, over a year. They, they came over last year, despite all the challenges of COVID, exercised at Royal Air Force Marham, exercised on the carrier. They came in advance of this deployment and trained with us to get the, the training certification uh, that Martin said. So I think to deploy at that level takes a lot of investment. But I, I think we would be open to other nations. But I think um, smaller uh, deployments, I, th I think, yes. You know, there are some complexities in operating off different carriers. Some have ramps, some don't. Uh, there's different connectivity. F-35 has a backbone of, you know, data, uh, you know, an, an IT infrastructure that you need to get right. But, but, but absolutely, I think going forward, F-35 gives us that ability in the air to interoperate. 
And I think, um, you know, and, and there are some things that F-35 program needs to do. They need, need to make some investments to make the computers speak to each other, to, to simply allow uh, an Italian, for instance, you know, maintainer to log on the computer and maintenance procedure when the logons are usually um, for UK personnel. So there are, it's not maybe as simple as one might think, um, but uh, we are going down that path right now. And we, we hope, um, you know, maybe later this appointment, certainly for the next one to, to get maybe the Italians on board. And I think that, and we'll, we'll expand that over time. So uh, yes, but again, I think, you know, we just need to be honest, F-35s are, you know, a, a very high end capability. We will buy a number of F-35s we are buying those to support our embarks requirements and also actually to put to be part of our wider combat air mix and for our purposes on land bases around the world. So we'll have to balance the amount of resource we offer to others, I think, for their carrier group with our own needs to do that. But again, there's lots of choice there. And I think um, fundamentally, so many, I think, like minded nations have bought the same airplane, I think, gives us, you know, real opportunities for the future. But I think that that. that so the U.S. Marine Corps, Al mentioned, you know, we've got close relationships with them um, and have done for many years. And, you know, UK F-35 did its basic training, RAF, Royal Navy pilots and engineers um, at U.S. Marine Corps Station Beaufort, Carolina. So before coming back to the U.K., um, so we've got those relationships. And, and it's one thing to land the jet on, take the picture, looks great. It's something fundamentally different to have an integrated capability. So there are U.S. munitions embarked in HMS Queen Elizabeth. They are properly integrated into that strike group. Um, and that's not something that many uh, navies and air forces tend to do. Um, and it takes a level of confidence, investment, trust that I think you know, we enjoy between the U.K. and, and, and U.S., uh, and hopefully we will do for many years to come. It doesn't mean we're going to be doing that every year. So, you know, we've proven we can achieve that this year, which I think is profound, significant. Um, we can, we, it shows we can do that at relatively short notice in the future now. Um, and we know what all the various pinch points and issues are. We know how to address them and overcome them. And I think that's, for operational planners, that gives a significant um, opportunity as well. Okay, thank you. And I will, um, if I may, sort of link Rob Bond's question to that um, because of speaking about cutting edge nature of CSG and F-35 Embar. Um, Rob says, given the strike group is cutting edge and likely to always comprise units from our allies, do you feel that the NATO EU national doctrine uh, has kept pace with this new capability? If it's the Rob Bond who used to work for me and is on staff course, it's a very good question, Rob. Well done. I wish you all the best on staff course. If it's somebody else, I apologise. Um, <laughs> so we, um, this, is, this is, as I say, uh, we've declared our, our strike groups in NATO. Um, so we've got to be able to work with our key NATO allies. Um, we are. We will. Um, the fact that we've invited and... Um, the Dutch Navy have been part of this planning for some time, and they've integrated with us and part of the strike group deployment is, I think, significant as well. That gives you a sense of how we might work with other like-minded uh, NATO navies uh, in the years ahead. The doctrine clearly will evolve. I mean, there is doctrine in terms of maritime doctrine, clearly, of how, about how we integrate strike groups uh, that's got to evolve to reflect the fifth generation capabilities we now have. Um, and we look forward to playing a key part in that. Yeah, and all I'd offer is, you know, I think, I think you, you can replace carrier strike group with cyber or space or SF or anything. I think, you know, NATO doctrine inherently, and there's some benefits to this, takes a little while to evolve. Um, and it doesn't necessarily knee jerk to the, to, to the new toy. So I think, I think yes, it does. And I think all, all nations are sanguine enough to, you know, operate with it or, you know, agree to operate slightly ahead of it uh, where it needs to be. So, yeah, I think, um, I think it's a, a, a question about the institution and its responsiveness just as much as the carrier strike group being a new thing. OK, thank you. I see that Rob's I see that Rob says that it is the same Rob Bond, um, which suggests we, we suggest that an idea for a dense defense research paper may be in the offing there. Um, OK, 
we've only got um, a couple of uh, a couple of uh, minutes left, and there are um, a couple of questions that we've not yet tackled. But I don't think we'll have time, unfortunately, to take them all. Um, but I'll take one which has been um, sitting for a short while, which is from Gabriele uh, Mongiovi, who says the Royal Navy has a history of carrying out all sorts of operations all around the world. Carrier strike forces require escort vessels. But so do other kinds of operations. And are you looking at acquiring more? Uh, are you looking into acquiring more escort vessels to adequately protect Queen Elizabeth II and Prince of Wales? Um, and I'll, if I may, I just add on to that the sort of the I the idea that if we are talking about uh, thoughts about rebalancing, of course, there is the fundamental challenge as ever of finance, which would also potentially apply to the uh, size of the embarked air force, be that F thirty five. Uh, be that uh, unmanned platforms, be that um, heliborne platforms. But to take that question a step further, do you see the uh, carrier strike group as offering the potential for a, a rebalancing in which the way the United Kingdom does business, therefore requiring more equipment? Or are we on a pretty steady course now with um, obvious um, uh, variations of that course? Uh, as time goes on, but it, are we pretty steadily and focused upon uh, where Carrier Strike Group is going without the need for uh, a considerable revisitation of procurement, do you think? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, Al and I are looking at the programmatic milestones for how Carrier Strike, um, with known programs, are going to be integrated into the capability. So, as I, I mentioned, the Royal Navy is growing, um, and I'm delighted that's the case. I'm delighted that we have new classes of ships now in build, and it's really exciting to see the first Type 26 come to life on the Clyde, um, and that'll be in service in a few years' time. We've got Type 31s coming into service as well. We've got fleet solid support ships. All of those will play an active part um, protecting and sustaining the carrier strike group. But we're also going to bring in, as we mentioned earlier, autonomous systems. Um, and those will be in every environment. So I'd imagine the carrier strike group of the 2030s will have UUVs. It will have um, autonomous surface vessels um, doing elements of in, in close in force protection and surveillance. And of course, it will have airborne sensors as well, both um, sensors to enhance our understanding, but also sensors that can carry payloads as well. So, you know, I think it, that's quite an exciting journey it's probably going to be for our successors and successor successors to manage all of that we've got our work cut out focus on the next few years to make sure that we as al and i described hit those key milestones um so that we can declare a full operating capability uh, yeah i just guess i think we've got 18 jets on board at the, the, the moment but the carrier can take more you know f-35b provides part of my combat air force mix uh, it can be embarked and not. So, you know, again, I'd be really keen to increase the number of F-35 as much as the overall defence fiscal balance uh, can uh, can bear. But clearly there, there's many of priorities going forward. But I think the really exciting thing, you know, probably a little bit beyond, you know, the era Martin said, um, but, you know, getting crewed and uncrewed teaming, you know, get high volume of assets on board, I think is something we should, we should really, really aspire to. You know, we've... We're in a really good place. You know, we bought we bought a, you know the the Queen Elizabeth class capability, that is you know has lots of lots of room for for growth, ambition to increase the rate of effort and offer us that choice. So I think that's really really exciting, and I don't think either of us could you know promise the future procurement path in either of our services. What's going forward and and various fiscal changes will affect that, um, but it does offer us a huge amount of, of choice over the coming decades. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very conscious of the fact that we are less than 60 seconds away from our scheduled end time. And obviously, um, both of our uh, speakers today have very generously given time out of what are uh, fantastically busy schedules to speak to us. So I think if I may, and with apologies to those whose questions I've not yet been able to ask, I think I'll draw proceedings to close here uh, I hope, like me, you've found this a most fascinating and insightful um, discussion, offering a range of insights uh, and analyses of the challenges, the opportunities that are presented by Carrier Strike, both in terms of equipment, training, uh, relationships and defence diplomacy. And I think we've had a very uh, comprehensive 
uh, and exceptionally useful um, discussion, uh, which of course would have been completely impossible without the uh, candid willingness of uh, Rear Admiral Connell and Air Vice Marshal Marshall uh, to speak to us today. So gentlemen, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you uh, to all participants. And I would just end um, by saying that there are future events. So those of you who may wish to attend anything in future, please keep an eye on the Freeman website. Uh, most notably, uh, you'll be seeing news about a uh, address that the Chief of the Air Staff will be giving um, very um, in the not too distant future. So please follow um, the website there. Um, and that I think is all I need to say, uh, apart from one final uh, very sincere thanks to our two speakers today for their contribution. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Take care. Thank you.